Festival guests are from Sumo Digital, the world-class development studio based in Sheffield, right here in Yorkshire, that has made amazing games such as Sonic and All-Stars Racing Transformed and Little Big Planet 3, and are also currently working on AAA games such as Crackdown 3 and Dead Island 2. And great news, Sumo was also the winner of the Best Large Independent Studio at the Tiger Awards last night. I think a round of applause for that, that is brilliant. <laughs> Go Yorkshire. So uh, today our speakers will be talking about Snake Pass, which is a brand new original title that came out of an internal game jam at the studio. And even though it's still in development, it's already impressing players and picking up best of show awards at events in the UK and abroad. So here with the talk, Sumo Snakes and Creative Sparks, please welcome creative director Sean Millard and designer Seb Lees. Hello. Hello, thanks for taking the time to come and hear us ramble for half an hour. Um, it's much appreciated. Um, so what we're going to talk about today really is the journey we've been on um, as a development team, as a designer, and as a production team at Sumo, taking an idea um, that cropped up from one of our, well, from our very first game jam internally, um, and where it's gone from that, in, from that initial creative spark to being a fully released game on Xbox One, PlayStation 4 and Steam early next year. It's been an interesting ride for a lot of different reasons. Hopefully we'll cover most of them in this talk. Um, but for those that don't know about Sumo, um, we were set up uh, in 2003 principally as a secure place to work after a fairly torrid experience at Infograms and from Gremlin previously to that in Sheffield. There were 12 or 13 of us that set it up in the first place and we decided that we were going to be a work for hire studio and work um, with partners and create games in already renowned franchises and in sort of like known universes. We've done a lot of work with Sega, um, we've done a lot of work with Microsoft, Sony, um, a lot of the big boys are our sort of friends now, and um, we've had an interesting career over the last sort of 13 years, but this is the first time we've really tackled doing something of our own. Um, so to, to bring you up to speed, uh, this, is what, um, this is what we're, this is a sort of our show, a little bit about Sumo for you.
so as you can see from that, we've done loads of different games and loads of different genres. And that's really where um, our expertise has begun to shine. Our staff have become, through necessity really, very versatile. One minute they'll be doing a driving game, the next minute they'll be doing a platformer. But we are, or always have been, a work for hire studio. So there's always been pressing engagements and commitments that we've got to deliver on. You know, first and foremost, Sumo are a sort of safe pair of hands. We're a really reliable developer that delivers on time and to budget. And although we had talked a lot about the concept of game jams, really for 18 months or two years, it wasn't until more, just over a year ago now that we did our first one. And, um, and that was because the existing commitments we felt like a big deal, but then when we actually sort of re realised that we could bite the bullet and just plan around those things, it seemed to be time just to instigate, instigate a game jam and see what we would get out of it. And from Sumo's point of view, we wanted to obviously give the staff an opportunity to flex their creative muscles. We were interested to see what they could come up with. If they could come up with anything, what would they do? And hopefully, one, two, three, four, five game jams down the line, something might be so good that we could take it further than that and put it into production ourselves and, ha and have our own IP and bring something new to the games market. Um, so, so we suggested doing that, and there was such a vibrant atmosphere in the, in the studio about, do, about doing that. It was such a successful operation. We couldn't believe that within, within the fir literally at the end of the first one, there was something that came along that really was pretty special. I mean, these are some examples of some of the other things that came out of the different game jams. So what was really cool was, to, was seeing how many different ideas came up, and how, what, what people could turn around in a day or two. I mean, people basically had a, a, a Friday dedicated to that and the weekend supplied by pizza to see what they could come up with. Um, but in the, uh, at the end of the first one, there was, there, was obvious, there was an obvious winner. Something special came along straight away. It, was, um, it wasn't the most imaginatively titled uh, entrant, I've got to say, Snake Simulator. Um, uh, but it did stand out. It stood out for a variety of reasons. It stood out because it was a un uh, it dealt with a unique mechanic. It was doing something new and innovative. Um, and it felt like it had the potential there. It needed, it obviously needed a lot of different things being done to it. And Seb, um, who came up with it himself, was, uh, was keen to do that. So we, um, out, straight out of the gate, we felt that we'd got a real result. So, um, this is what it looked like. This is, this is Seb's um, entering into the very first sumo game jam for Snake Simulator.
So with that, I mean, I'll hand you over to Seb now to talk a little bit about where the ideas came from in the first place, um, how he came to Simo from Holland. Um, he's got an interesting story to tell himself. So this is Seb. Uh, thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, just want to say, just seeing that video again just puts a smile back on my face. Just, it's so derpy to look at now, and especially with this music on there, it's just really funny to to see that back, uh, knowing what it has become at this point. Uh, anyway, I'll tell you a little bit about my background first, because uh, I got a bit a bit of an interesting story, I think, uh, about how I actually ended up in the games industry. Quite unusual compared to uh, most people. Uh, about five years ago, I was also speaking in front of audiences, but uh, back then I was actually a biology teacher in a high school in Holland, uh, which means I actually have a university degree in biology. And um, I always had a, a huge fascination and obsession with video games. I've been playing six, eight hours of video games a day for as long as I can remember. I listen to video games, music, I'm, I'm a proper video game geek. But for some reason, uh, my, my, the near people around me, when I had to choose which study I was going to pick, uh, there was always this impression of video games there's not really a future in there and you need to do something with science. So, well, I was only 17 when I had to make the decision, so I decided indeed to go to uni and study biology. But um, already during the second year of biology, I, I realized I was probably in the wrong spot because I, I was still spending most of my free time just playing video games. Uh, but well, I was already two years in, so I actually decided to just finish it. But in the, at the same time, in the evening hours, I, I spent hours and hours uh, playing video games until the day I actually discovered a PC game called Spore. So a couple of years old, and it was one of the first games that allowed you to to generate content, to create uh, stuff for other people to play with. And um, I, I found that really interesting to do, really fascinating. And I spent every evening for a couple of years just making stuff for other people to play with. And I got a, a really big kick out of the idea that people were having fun with the stuff I was creating. Uh, so around the same time, so I played sport for about two years, and then I finished my university. And I had to make a choice what I'm going to do now with this university degree in biology. And just as most people that don't know what to do with the university degree do, is I ended up becoming a teacher. So for three years, uh, I was a biology teacher in Holland for between 16 and 19 year old kids. And uh, that was very interesting. Uh, it was not really my thing because I was still in, in the evening hours, I was still this gaming geek. And then during the day, I had to pretend to be this really responsible teacher guy. So there was a, I didn't really feel comfortable in there, and then sometimes the students could, could easily tell that I'd been playing video games still in the late hours. So yeah, it wasn't really the, the perfect spot for me. So I was still dreaming about trying to get into the video games industry. And then I found out online that the best creators of Little Big Planet, uh, a PlayStation game a couple years old, that uh, the people who created the best content for that was, were being hired by the creators of the game. Uh, as soon as I heard that, I bought a PlayStation, I bought Little Big Planet, I stopped playing Spore, and I spent all my free time in creating stuff in Little Big Planet. I got better and better at doing that, and, and got generated lots of subscribers, and people really started to play my stuff. And um, after about two years, I was still teaching at the time. After about two years, one day, I got a magical email from Sumo. Uh, we found your stuff online, we, we're really impressed with your work, would you like to get a job with us? And that was one of the best days of my life. Uh, I instantly quit my job. Uh, I still had a, an exam class at the time, which I sort of dis ditched. Sorry, guys. <laughs> uh, yeah, I moved to England and I actually never looked back, never had any regrets. And I, so I got the chance to, to work on Little Big Planet 3, which was at the time in development by Sumo. And uh, well, Little Big Planet was one of my, it still is one of my favorite games. So I, I got the chance to actually not only go into the game industry, but also work on my favorite game. So I felt very lucky for that. Had a two, two years, two and a half years on that game. Very good development. And uh, after that project was done, there was a bit of a gap for me to switch to a next project. And uh, Sumo had asked me during that time to try to learn the Unreal Engine, because the new project I was going to work on was using Unreal. Uh, so, yeah, the sort of hence the, the little big dreams. I always dreamed to be a game designer, and through this path of perseverance, I actually managed to, to, to land this job. So while learning Unreal to, for, in preparation for the next project, uh, what I like to do when I learn new software is I just set some goal for myself, and I try to just make that and figure out how to do that. 
And the simple goal I set to myself was uh, to make a rope that would swing when the player walked into it. Very simple. And you can see a picture on the top left there of the very, the very, very first early prototype of what eventually turned out to be the snake. Because uh, while I was making the rope, I forgot to attach it to the ceiling. And when it fell on the floor in this really nice looking smooth curve, I thought, wow, I've never seen anything like that before. I've never seen that type of motion in a video game before. I wonder if I can actually control this rope. So the first step to uh, the, 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 what would become the snake simulator was actually a, a controllable rope, the one you see in the top left. Then uh, around that same time, so when I was between projects, I worked on this for a few evenings at home. And then uh, the, the, game, the game jam came up. And uh, I decided to just enter this as, as an idea. And on the actual game jam day, we managed to, with the help of uh, Chris Barrett, one of my colleagues, we managed to turn the, the rope without any head in the day's work into this green snake. And then the weekend afterwards, we sort of built a little playground around it to, uh, to show off what he can do. And one of the, Second, yeah. Tell him about your geeky snakes. Yes, yeah, it, 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 well, <laughs> my geeky snakes, yeah. While I was in university, I actually owned two pet snakes, <laughs> solid and liquid snake. <laughs> yeah, I know, that, that's how geeky uh, I was at that time. Uh, but uh, I, so I spent hours and hours on the couch while watching television with these snakes crawling around my hands and my arms. So I was really well aware of how their muscles work and exactly how a snake uses his body to move around. So while I was making this, uh, that became one of my core goals. Like if I'm going to make a snake, I want to be able to move that snake kind of realistic. So. Uh, one of the main focuses of the controls for this game is going to be the fact that you really have to think and move like a snake, really use your body the way a real snake would. And yeah, that, that was actually uh, the result of the game jam, what you just saw. And so, and so from that, what, explain a little bit about what happened after you won then, what, what, what we sort of decided to do with it. Right, so initially the, the, the idea was to, to, as quickly as possible, actually within a month time, to try to make something out of this prototype that we would be able to put on Steam or a, at least put out into the world. And so they gave me, uh, Sumo gave me initially two designers and a coder to try to, to get this to something that we could put out in the world within a month. And after a month, we had the opportunity to show the bosses what we've done in the month and we were going to present like this is what we want to put out in the world. But when the, the bosses saw the work we had achieved within that month, they were so impressed that they were like, no, it's too good now. You have to keep working on it. It's too good to push out now. So uh, that was a huge boost. Uh, we got extra people, extra money, extra time. And that's when it, it really started to take off. And uh, around that same time was, uh, we're talking about early this year then, so between January and April. Uh, in early April, there was EGX Rest in London. So the, the, the goal became then to try to make something that we could take to EGX Rest to sh actually show the public uh, as, as uh, our own IP. And so we worked really hard with, those, with that small group of people to try to turn this green prototype snake thing into something that would look and play like a real video game. And in that time, we obviously got some concept out done, didn't we? The look and the feel of the snake started changing. The world started taking shape. I mean, speak a little bit about the concept of what happened when we got that. Right, yeah, so one of the, so we had this snake and then we knew there was a very interesting movement mechanic there, but then you have the decision, what, what actually is the game? How big do you make a level? Is it, is it an open world game? Is it a short monkey ball type, just do a quick arcade and then the next level? This is so different. There were many different paths we could take. And uh, one of the most important moments during the, that early development was actually when we finally managed to get some time of one of our concept artists. So we were already building levels in, in different sizes. We're running into all kinds of problems. And uh, a lot of those problems actually disappeared after we received that picture on the left side, which is actually um, a screenshot from one of our levels where the, the concept artist just drew over the top. And one of the simple things he, he did in that picture was remove the, the floor under the level. Because one of the, the, the main struggles, main problems we had early in the game was the fact that whenever you climb up something and you fall down, it was kind of frustrating and punishing to have to climb all the way back up. 
And this artist just did a very simple decision and he decided to just remove the floor. And for some reason, us designers had never thought about that as a solution. But that sort of just sort of streamlined the game in one go. Now when you fall, you just die and you respawn close to where you were before. And it just took away a lot of the frustration and, and made the game a lot smoother to play. So yeah, that was a very important moment. And yeah, that shows that having these different kinds of disciplines weigh in on your idea is really creates a sum that is bigger than the parts. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. You got it right. <laughs> well um, uh, yeah, so, so we sort of reached this end of pre uh, essentially, I suppose, a pre-production phase or an early production phase in time for EGX in, um, in April just gone. And, and this video shows the sort of like uh, where, the, where the game was at that point. So we can show you a little bit of an evolution from that sort of plasticky green expressionless snake you saw at the game jam. We sort of moved it on a little bit for that. As you can see, this is uh, so we're January, February, March, April, four months uh, after the initial prototype, uh, we managed to produce this with a very small team. And um, well, we took this is what we took to EJX Rest, and well, that was just really awesome to, to be able to take your own idea and build it into something that looks as good as that. Like I, I'm so so proud of that that little green thing turned in this awesomely looking colorful nice game and then you bring it to the public and, and you sit in your studio for three months every day you stare at the same thing and you get really close to it and, and you kind of get blind for what's good and what's not good and you, you're stuck in your little team and you, you get the feeling that you're onto something and, but then being able to actually take it to one of these conferences and then see the public play it and and realized that everybody that touches it almost falls in love with it. And we had audiences around our booth for the entire weekend. And that was just such an amazing feeling to, like when I was a creator at home for Little Big Planet and Spore, you, you get the feeling that people are playing it. And every now and then you get a comment of someone saying, oh, that was a nice level, or I had fun playing that. But when you're actually standing there and you see whole families with smiles on their face playing your own game, yeah, that's the best feeling in the world. So that the result, uh, I'm well, super proud of. Yeah. Well, so, and so so the result of that positive feedback was sort of like it vindicated our position in terms of wanting to develop it further, and then Sima put it into full production, didn't they? So you've had nine months. Yeah, but you've you've had, yeah. you've had about nine months since then, weren't you? And so. Yeah, so at, at that point, when we brought this to EJX Rest, it was sort of a make or break moment for us, where if. It was gonna. If people liked it, we were probably gonna continue with it. But if it was sort of a dud, then we would probably move on from it and never look at it again. But because the the reactions were so positive, uh, actually, there's the Monday straight after that weekend, we decided to go into full production, and uh, we got a full team, full producer, uh, and uh, about nine months to actually make this prototype, what it still was at the time, uh, into a full game. And uh, yeah, that, that was a big shift because we were constantly with this very small team with people very close to it. And then suddenly you get all these new people in with, with new ideas and, and, and different views on how things should or should not be. Uh, so that first few weeks were, they were definitely very difficult to get everybody uh, sort of on the same line and to make sure that the vision that 
we set up and started out to, to achieve, that that still stayed the same. Um, so yeah, there was quite a bit of struggle at the, at the beginning, quite a lot of heated discussion about what we should and what we should not keep. Uh, for example, um, after we made the core mechanics of the slithering, uh, for a while we had a bunch of power-ups, uh, like you could jump up in the air or, or swing uh, by a still, all kinds of extra abilities. But uh, well, the, really the vision for the game was it needs to be a physical platforming game, and the physics was the most important thing. So at some point we had to make the tough decision to, to not go with power-ups, because they sort of break the idea of the game being physical, and we, we just stayed with the most purest, uh, the, the essence of the game, really <coughs> thinking and moving like a snake. And so, the, so production sort of continued, didn't it, until EGX? Last year, that, uh, last month, that became a bit of a milestone. We were gearing up towards a demo for that. And where was yeah. that, Birmingham? Yes. Yeah, and you went down there. And so we, we can show you a little bit now, a, little, a quick little clip um, of the basically the latest incarnation of the game. Uh, it's sort of an alpha stage, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, and if you, you can see the, the progression as well. Like, as I forgot to mention this, I was supposed to say something about this as well, but uh, one of the main things we, we struggled with in the beginning is the fact that people have an in, a lot of people have an inherent fear of snakes, and a, a snake being the main character of the game. Um, and me having owned two pet snakes, it really never occurred to me that snakes are considered scary. Or just it's seeing a snake can make people feel uncomfortable. So once people started pointing out that to me, it became very important that we needed to make the game as friendly and as cute as possible. So you see between the iterations that you've seen now, we started off with this super realistic, almost evil looking green snake. And then in the second iteration, you just saw it became more derpy, more friendly. But the big thing was we brought some more characters in, specifically Honeydew. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. So the head changed. Uh, we, we, the game felt a, a bit lonely every now and then, and there was also some practical uh, problems that the game had, and they were all solved by adding a little sidekick, a hummingbird, that helps you around. And, and <coughs> show yeah. it now. Yeah, let's go. So that's the, the sort of the current state of the game. We're a little bit, we're a few weeks further now, but pre-alpha. And um, yeah, you can see. So the, the snake has evolved into a sort of a Disney-looking snake, and we we have a hummingbird sidekick character, and um, we very much focused on the physics of the character and the gameplay revolving around physics. So you'll see in later levels in the game, things will start moving around, and you get really interesting interactions between that long snake body and the moving elements in the, in the game. Cool. And so obviously while Seb was slaving away in the Unreal Engine, I was gallivanting out across the world at different shows, talking to different publishers, different um, partners, and, show, and we were showing off the, the latest demos and talking about the game to lots of different people. And we were getting unanimous, unanimously good responses from everyone. And, that raised the question then of whether we go with a publishing partner or whether we decide to publish the game ourselves. And we went backwards and forwards on that for quite a while until we decided that we would take the plunge and learn about self-publishing and put it out ourselves on PlayStation, Xbox and Steam, which for me is a really exciting thing for Sumo to be doing. It's a, Again, it's completely out of our comfort zone. It's something new. It's something exciting. It's shaking things up a little bit, which I think will be... Um, 
a great thing for us, but hopefully a really good thing for the games we make too. Um, but it's interesting that the, you know, the responses that we had from people, they were, some of them were physical, they wanted to be swallowing things and having that act, uh, change the, the powers of the, um, uh, of the snake, Noodle is, uh, as he's called now. But weirdly, unanimously, everyone wanted to see the snake in a hat and we've never really understood <laughs> why everyone's first response is, yeah, brilliant, can you put hats on it? Um, I, I don't know if that says something about our culture nowadays, but um, it's certainly a curiosity for us. But, that, um, but, but yeah, so universally positive responses, so it just kept encouraging us to build on it and build on it. And um, I, I, I really think the future for the game is as bright as it can be. I mean, like, like Jamie said when, we, when he introduced us, we, we won an award last night for being an indep independent studio. And this, to all intents and purposes, is an indie game, but there seems to be a very different um, interpretation of what indie means or what independent means, which is probably a topic for another day. But um, I'm proud to say that, that we're independent, and um, we are, and we will always fight for our independence. And I, think, I, and I hope that this goes some way into sort of redefining slightly what an indie game can mean. Uh, uh, obviously, it's more than just an indie game. It's got the production values of sort of sumo behind it. But um, what I'd really like is, for, is to hear what you guys think. And the game is playable all weekend. Come and see these two little goony people down the front here. They'll be happy to show you the game, give you some hands on time with it. And please get in touch and, and get in touch with our community and tell us what you think and give us plenty of feedback. Um, I hope you enjoy it, and I hope this was useful for you. Cheers. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Sean and Seb. Um, any questions for the team about Snake Pass? <laughs> nope. Yeah, okay. <laughs> there is, actually, the at the back there. Damn. There we go. Yeah, didn't get away with it, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, uh, just to start off, I'm definitely going to be buying it when it comes out. <laughs> That's good. But there's one important detail I need to know beforehand. You said that the snake's name is Noodle, but what is the hummingbird's name? Oh, here we go again. <laughs> Honeydew. Honeydew? Yeah. That's adorable. Yeah, I know. It's adorable as a big plummy eyes. <laughs> right. And will there be plushies of these? Because, uh, you know, it's... <laughs> That's for after hours, Jamie, and you know it. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, any other questions for... Yeah, there's... Uh, do you want to go with the guy just next, next to you? Yeah, there. Oh. <laughs> Walk right by you. Okay, uh, just one. a quick question for yeah. Seb. Um, do you know when you said you came out from teaching biology and then you got an email saying that, you know, you want to work with Sumo, um, what were the struggles when you came to learning Unreal, and how long did it take you to pick it up? Um, <clears throat> well, there was the two-year period between me actually moving from biology teacher to Sumo and then starting with Unreal, so there's kind of two different things. So maybe I should answer them separately? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, the, the, uh, like, well, yeah, of course, if you dream about getting a job as a game designer then, and you don't know that much about it and you don't have any training in that direction, you do have this image of, like, a Google working environment where people are playing basketball during meetings and, and that type of things. But that's, that's not the reality of, uh, of it. Maybe there's one or two studios in the world that actually act like that, but we're, Sumo we're is... We're not huge sportsmen at Sumo, no. No, but... Uh, no. <laughs> we look but yeah, more so like that, that impression, that, that dreamy impression that I had of, of the game industry that turned out to be quite different. It is a, a very much still an office job in the sense that you are stuck behind your desk for the majority part of the day, and that was maybe slightly different than I thought it would be. But then again, I love sitting behind my PC and making stuff, so it was still really, really good. But my initial impression of what it was going to be was actually quite different from what it turned out to be, but not worse in any way. Um, then the second part about Unreal, um, I actually, before I started playing with Unreal, I had a couple weeks, probably two, three weeks, where I, just, where I thought I was going to learn myself Unity. 
And um, I really, really struggled with that. And I, I was working on an idea for two weeks and I would still not have anything playable because that constantly requires you to know at least a basic amount of code, which I don't know anything of. Um, I had a completely opposite experience with Unreal because Unreal doesn't require you to know any code. And it's also in some ways similar to Little Big Planet in the way you make your logic and you make complicated things work. So you basically connect wires together and you make something work that way. So I found it incredibly easy actually to get started with Unreal. And within a week, I was already making simple prototypes, simple mini games, also because of the huge library of resources you get online to learn things with Unreal. And um, actually this prototype of the snake, I think I, it was about three weeks after I very, for the first time started Unreal that I made that. So yeah, Unreal, I love Unreal. I can't say enough positive things about it really. Cool, great. Uh, what about, uh, was a hand went up at that side? Yeah, there's a lady there. On, on your right there, just, yeah. <laughs> I noticed that like there were many design changes of the snake. Like, how many did you go through? Because I thought it was really like curious looking how it went from looking sort of like that weird dinosaur from good dinosaur to looking a lot like car. Did it ever go through a sort of stage apart from the first one where it might have looked a bit frightening? Uh, no, the, the, the very first one was actually the most frightening we had. But the, the, me with the biology background, and when I had this idea of wanting the snake to have realistic movement, it was a very logical conclusion to also try to make the environment and the snake and everything look realistic. So, and the actual prototype name was also Snake Simulator. So initially in my head, uh, it was going to be a very realistic snake simulator where you possibly even eat and strangle things. Uh, and, <laughs> Yeah, but when people started pointing out uh, that creeps me out, or just the movement alone, I don't want to look at it. I started realizing, okay, if we want to, this to appeal to a large audience, we really need to cutify it as, as much as we can. So yeah, the, the most scary version was definitely the first version, and after that, we just tried to make it more and more cute, actually. Yeah, I, I do admire like how, the, how bright the colors go with the background. Because I do a lot of, like, I'm more of the artistic side, because I'm not a coder either, but a lot of my stuff can be quite frightening when I'm designing stuff. But it has essentially gone through three main phases. There's, yeah. Se there's Seb's initial semi-realistic phase, and there's the second phase that you said looked a bit like a car, did you say? It looked like one of Pixar's cars. No, it looked like uh, that Arlo, the dinosaur. Uh, okay. You know, the green thing. Yeah, yeah, I know yeah. exactly what you mean. But the, the, the mid phase for me always reminded me of uh, Pixar's cars, the way the eyes were. It always looked like Lightning McQueen. And um, and we sort of we moved on now to to, the, to, to this. So it's, it's really been through three main identifiable phases. I think it's adapted itself to. But the concept artist has drawn probably at least oh, 40, 50 yes. different yeah. versions of the head. Yeah, they, they, and, and, and there's at least a dozen different designs for what Honeydew could look like, from sort of a bloated little thing that could only just keep herself up to a lean, mean, sort of like dart. They, they, you know, everything goes through several iterations, even if they're just pencil thumbnails. Yeah, and when, once we decided that we wanted to go with colorful, cartoony, uh, I really became I really wanted to make it feel like one of the games that I grew up with. Like in the 90s, I played Spyro the Dragon, Donkey Kong Country, like colorful rare games, Banjo Kazooie, that type of games. And when we decided to go with colorful, I, I went like, yeah, okay, then we we're going to make it look like a 90s game, but update it to the 2016. As you said that you came from Holland, uh, obviously that's quite a big step coming over to England. Uh, so would you recommend that if we were to ever get offered like a job to say in America as a part like as a, an attempt in a games company would you recommend that we take it as it's quite a big leap and obviously if it falls flat you're sort of left in the space of how would I then get back to my original place no, yeah, stay in Yorkshire yeah I was going to say <laughs> obviously we're going to say stay in Yorkshire but also we're going to say just do it don't I mean Seb might have a completely different opinion but I would say don't think about it do it you know get every opportunity you can wherever you can every one of them is going to be valuable and you'll learn even more somewhere else you can always come back home yeah. so it would just be like the priority of like say if you move to america or somewhere and then you you'd you'd be a of, cowboy you, and everything you'd, you'd sort of be cut <laughs> off at that point where it's like oh I, I can't come home because i don't have the funding or something to get back to the actual place where i come from 
Well, for me, you know, obviously now after the Brexit, that's going to be different. But <laughs> before the Brexit, it was very easy for me to just, uh, like, I, I don't have to even have to do anything. I just register in Holland that I'm moving to England, and then I'm registering in, in England. I moved over here, and that's pretty much all I had to do. So that, that wasn't really an issue for me. It probably would have been a bigger decision if I had to, if the job offer was had been in America, but I would definitely still have made that choice. Because so obviously, you could still have like contact with people from Holland and that a lot, but yeah, yeah, you sort of have to make that decision. Nowadays, Do I want to? With the internet, to it's here. so easy to to just keep in touch with with the home front, and yeah. I hear from a lot of people, obviously because of my weird entry into the industry, I have talked to a lot of people about how they got in. And uh, something you keep hearing is that that foot in the door, that, that first step in is, is the most difficult and most important bit. Once you have that and once you can start putting on your CV, I worked on this game, I worked on this game, then doors start opening elsewhere as well. So yeah, I would definitely... If you don't, unless you have something that really keeps you here, if you have an attractive offer somewhere abroad, definitely go for it, I'd say. Thank you for your time. Oh. Hi. Um, so, first of all, I just want to quickly say that the, the game just looks absolutely amazing, and it's, it's very unique, and it's got like this, this really nice kind of en like enchanting elegance, like it wants it, it's like really peaceful, but it wants to, it's making me want to like explore all of the all of what the game has to offer um but one major question is really nagging at me will you be giving it the option to give it hats <laughs> <laughs> we've, it we've not come. gone for hats but we are thinking about balaclavas <laughs> if possible i would recommend a nice top hat and a monocle that would be absolutely amazing that's a very popular choice <laughs> yeah thank you maybe maybe, maybe. The, the, the problem one of the problems with it is that it's a physics based game and as soon as you put a giant thing on his head just wrapping around things don't think he's becomes being really serious. difficult i, I know, know. I, I still <laughs> i just want to shut these people up for, once and for all just, <laughs> no hats stop asking about hats <laughs> right. uh, yeah. thanks a lot for your time then thanks, and, and do try and get some hands on with the game this weekend um, and let us know what you think cheers thank you to sean said brilliant <laughs>